So this is going to be my first class covering ethical hacking, but in order to kind of dive into teaching you guys how to do some of these things, I need to give you the framework to understand what you're about to learn. So you need to understand how hackers fit into society. Uh, if you're considering learning to uh, use the tools of a hacker, you might be perceived as one, and it's important to know how people already kind of see hackers in society. So cyber warfare is a kind of constant state of affairs nowadays. Uh, countries have their own militaries that have hacking divisions. And knowing the difference between commercial, cybersecurity, and uh, like penetration testers and the sort of stuff you'll be learning, and cyber warfare, which is much more kind of a, a global uh, advanced thing, is what I want you to learn a little bit about today. So the first thing that we're going to go into is what is the definition of a hacker? Now, if you go to a hacker convention like DEF CON, the common definition is uh, somebody who takes technology and makes it does something it wasn't designed to do. Now, that can be something like taking an old radio and, and making it uh, hack cell phone signal, signals or otherwise finding cool ways of reusing technology. But when we talk about security, the word hack is often used to refer to the process of making advice to something other than it was intended to do. That's one definition. Uh, also, an expert at programming and solving problems with a computer. And then uh, also a person who illegally gains access to and sometimes tampers with information in a computer system. Now, some of those have negative connotations, and some of them are more about uh, curiosity and the way that you express yourself with technology. And hackers, in fact, intersect in both of those realms. And we will go now into kind of the different types of hackers and the motivations that they have that make them unique. So the first thing you should know is hacking is a legitimate industry. It's a $75 billion industry, so these skills are very, very expensive. Uh, these people are bug hunters, people that track down uh, problems in applications and websites, penetration testers that test the, the uh, security of businesses that are, you know, run essential services, uh, cybersecurity experts that are con uh, like uh, consultants and experts, uh, software developers who actually write security programming, uh, antivirus, and most uh, major companies. So. Uh, a lot of money is made by this. You can make money by turning in uh, bugs. Now, if you see here, uh, Hacker One and Bug Crowd uh, have amateur hackers, like even all the way up to professional hackers, who turn in bugs and problems they find in applications all over the place. Now, that is actually the kind of the Uber of hacker right now. Like, uh, it's uh, on demand hacking by crowdsourcing it, having all these hackers everywhere work on teams for these companies, like uh, a very well known example is Uber. So, Uber was actually uh, this is the problem. When you find a vulnerability for a company, you need to be professional. If you're not professional, it looks a lot like extortion. If you ask for money in exchange for this very critical problem you just found. Now, Uber just ran into this problem where they went with, I think it was uh, one of these companies, oh, I won't say which because I'm not sure, and the problem was somebody found a vulnerability, but they, they took a step of stealing the data as well, which you're not supposed to do, and then turned around and asked for a lot of money in order to give it back. Now, giving it back what does that even mean? If they've copied it, there's no way to tell, but Uber paid in order to keep them quiet, which looked a lot like ransom. So you have to be careful when you work in this industry because even though there's programs like this set up, it's easy to step outside the lines and do something that could get you arrested because it looks like you're blackmailing the company. So the most common type of hackers you'll hear about are white hat hackers. Now, these are ethical hackers. Uh, they're people that work for companies to secure them from threats. Now, another word for uh, this would be like a blue team or a, a group that's like designed to basically provide defense and look for different uh, attacks. So they have access granted to them by the companies that they work for, which means they don't work against a disadvantage. They're granted whatever they want. So they're not as challenged to break in because they, they can walk right in the door. They're, they're part of the team. Uh, they also will use things that are legal to use, regardless of whether or not they're the most effective tool. Now, if you think about that, that actually handicaps them because they don't use the bleeding edge techniques that might actually be illegal. Um, so white hat hackers are great. They keep things safe, but they're not always maybe the most experienced because they don't use techniques that are illegal. They have to, they're in the public eye. They have to stay very like above the board. So white hat hackers make money um, from their employers uh, through pursuing research, finding bugs in applications, and as bug bounty hunters. Um, so uh, you might also see them on penetration testing teams. Uh, that's generally what white hacker, hat hackers do. Uh, gray hat hackers are a little different. These are people that straddle the line, and they're generally motivated by curiosity. They want to know the limits of things. They're curious. They want to push things and find out, can I do it? Um, this is a lot of hackers. And in general, it's also why our industry gets kind of a, a bad name sometimes. It's because a lot of us will be more interested in pursuing you know, what's really out there. Like, we want to know, like, the best and the most interesting techniques. And we don't really care, you know, if they're completely legal. We want to know about them because if we're defending a network, criminals aren't going to use the legal techniques. They're going to use whatever works. So gray hat, gray hat hackers <clears throat> most commonly make money 
uh, either as bug hunters or as penetration testers because their asymmetrical skills give businesses the knowledge they need to patch up anything that's kind of like low hanging or easy uh, targets for real criminals. So penetration testing teams come in and they will actually simulate a, a, an attacker and attempt to do everything an attacker would do and see how the business holds up. Now, if the, if the business collapses, they know they have a problem. And that's how they make money. Black hat hackers are the biggest threat to networks uh, in general because there's all different kinds of them. And they're generally only bound together by the fact that they have zero commitment to use legal or ethical tactics. They will use anything that works to advance whatever their agenda is. And these are typically criminals, nation state hackers, uh, advanced persistent threat groups, which we'll get into in a little bit, and organized crime. Uh, so because some of these people are also state-sponsored, which means they are supported by the governments of the countries that they work in, some of these people are very difficult to actually prove that they're doing something bad because they uh, work behind a veil of kind of like state secrecy. Uh, black hack hackers typically make money from data theft, uh, selling credit card information, wire fraud, malware, and other types of crime and extortion. Uh, their goal is usually to use their tech, uh, technical expertise to, uh, expertise to advance their agenda, and they don't really care about uh, damaging or uh, harming anyone or anything else. So when we look at different type of hackers, uh, you, as threats, the way that we do it is kind of like a math problem. Motive plus capabilities equals threat class, and threat class plus history equals threat. Now what that means is that hackers are people you have to understand not only their technical skill set, but also the motivation that drives them. In order to understand if someone is likely to be a threat or what kind of threat they might be, you have to look at their motivations, why they do what they do, the, their capabilities, what they can actually do, and then assess what they're capable of. After that, by looking at their history, you can get a general idea of what they're capable of and what they're more likely to do. And that's the perspective that security experts take when looking at different threat groups uh, that have been, let's, let's say, like in the Sony hack. Those people had to kind of look and examine like who was capable of doing this, what were their motivations, and in the end, what did they do? And had they done anything like that before that could be tied together into a pattern of behavior? So some common types of motivations uh, for hackers, uh, and this is the, the reason why they do what they do, is uh, curiosity and intellectual challenges. Some people want to be the best. They want to know that they can break into the best security because they know they're capable of it, or they think they are, and they like proving that they can do something that they're not supposed to be able to do. Now, that's genuinely, generally like not a very malicious thing. It's like these people just enjoy being excellent, and that's why gray hat hackers exist by and large. It's because they're not, their curiosity sometimes isn't constrained by the law, and that's also where they get into trouble. So cyber criminals don't care. <laughs> they use all of the skills that they have in order to try to uh, do online tactics like cyber, uh, let's see, but cyber tactics like scams through emails, like basically exploiting uh, technology through use of their technical skills to get what they want. Hacktivists will advance a political agenda. These are things like anonymous, you might have heard of, or telecomics. Now some of these uh, are, uh, I hesitate to say uh, anonymous is a little bit more like disorganized, but organizations like, uh, or hacktivist uh, collectives like telecomics have actually taken part in like major political events like the Arab Spring where they uh, work to support uh, basically uh, groups that were cut off and censored by the government in order to make sure that they still had uh, access, even after the government shut off large parts of internets in the country, of the internet in the country. So they were able actually to use their skills for t uh, political change and uh, basically empower activists who had been like cut off from information uh, from a government that was uh, trying to basically wipe them out. Uh, let's see. Hacking groups, um, these are, again, the basically hacktivist groups that don't have the same sort of political aspirations. Groups of people that are skilled but maybe just bored. Um, LulzSec might be an example of a group that doesn't have any particular political affiliations. They just go around and break stuff because they can. Um, nation states are the most popular uh, supporters of hacking uh, organizations now, and their groups tend to be classed as what we call advanced persistent threats. So nation states have the goal of uh, destroying another nation's weapons, uh, like being able to cripple another nation's military in the event of uh, a war. Uh, they generally uh, pour a lot more money and resources into their organizations. And finally, well, not finally, uh, organized crime uh, has adapted to uh, how much money you can make online doing cybercrime to massively invest in organized schemes to make money. So techno criminals are the last class. These are people that skim your credit card at gas stations. Uh, they're the people that dig through your mail and uh, call you and say, hi, I'm Microsoft support. Your computer's broken and try to get you to like, like install something. They suck. They're the lowest common denominator. Uh, but that's uh, another kind of group that you'll see. 
So the capability of hackers can be broken up into a pyramid. And at the very top is the most rare, the most expensive, the most uh, like training required groups are advanced persistent threats. So at the bottom is uh, an unsophisticated threat. And I'll get a little bit more into what these mean. So as you can see, the groups, these are grouped into unsophisticated threats, unsophisticated persistent threats, smart threats, smart persistent threats, advanced threats, and advanced persistent threats. And the difference between a persistent threat and a non-persistent threat <clears throat> is that a persistent threat will pick one target and they will not stop until they get into that target. That's just how they operate. Their goal is to break into a single organization so they don't go around and look for whatever is easy. They target a single thing. So unsophisticated threats, uh, some examples are lazy dads, uh, lazy, sorry, lazy criminals, crazy dads, teenagers, neighbors from hell, robots, uh, these are just like bots. Uh, they use tools that are well documented and have been around for a very long time because they need it because they suck. They're not good at this. Um, they're point and click tools, things like low orbit ion cannon, old hardware flaws. Uh, they use YouTube tutorials because they're just not good at this stuff. Um, so a case study of unsophisticated threats, um, some common slang for people that fit into this class are neighbors from hell, uh, skids, which are unskilled hackers that only use their skills for petty crime, script kitties, which are people that only use other people's tools and uh, can't write their own. Uh, so one example is this guy named Barry Adol Ardolf uh, in Minnesota. So he had some sort of dispute with his neighbor and his reaction to that dispute was to hack his Wi-Fi, send a bunch of death threats to the vice president, and then send a bunch of child pornography to this guy's employer, seemingly from his own IP address, from the neighbor's IP address. He got caught super fast because uh, he was not very good at this. And it also took him three weeks to learn something that most hackers take maybe an hour to learn. So smart threats are the next step up. Uh, they're more skilled opponents who have some technical skills. And in general, penetration testers are kind of designed to uh, simulate this kind of threat. Uh, they use, uh, these are like more effective criminals, hacker, uh, students who have some sort of skill in technology, maybe like you guys. Uh, private businesses uh, that you know, specialize in this sort of thing and insider threats, like people that work at companies uh, that leave, uh, basically put them in a position to do some damage. Uh, they use tools that aren't free. Uh, they use advanced frameworks used by professionals. Uh, they use Linux-based frameworks and they use clever attacks uh, that uh, exploit uh, a lot of different vulnerabilities. So an example of a smart threat was one of the biggest data breaches in US history. Uh, this guy, uh, Albert Gonzalez, detected that there was a insecure wireless network being used in some TJ Maxx stores in their credit card processing terminals. It takes like five minutes to hack into these. Uh, so he, he hacked in, stole a bunch of credit card data, and then pivoted into the corporate network and started stealing millions of people's credit card uh, information uh, numbers. Yeah. So he ended up stealing 130 million. Uh, <laughs> pieces of credit card data, and he sold it to make money. And of course, he got caught uh, because this was a massive, massive, massive uh, crime. And this was, again, one of the biggest data breaches out there. But so many people's data was exposed. Like This basically invalidated like all these credit cards. It was, it was a huge, huge, huge thing. Um, so one thing to note is they don't have access to special things like zero-day vulnerabilities. Uh, we'll get into that in a second. But that means that they use stuff that's already in the public eye. You can Google it and find these tools. They don't use stuff that's secret. So advanced persistent threats are people who have significant resources. These are nation states, intelligence agencies, hacktivist collectives, terrorist organizations, criminal enterprises, and uh, criminal proxies of intelligence agencies. And what that means is in some countries like Russia, uh, if you hack the United States and you're just some, some guy that's a hacker, they will generally leave you alone, provided that you're willing to give them access to some of the companies that you hack. So if you're just hacking US corporations and it's in the interest of the Russian intelligence agency to be able to have access to some of those, you will only go to jail if you say no when they make a request. So uh, these people have access to the technical skills to find zero day vulnerabilities. And what that means is they've found problems that nobody else is aware of. That gives them almost like godlike abilities to just get into computers and nobody has any idea how they're doing it because the vulnerabilities are not yet known. So an advanced persistent threat uh, that is extremely famous is the is Project Olympic Games. That was a coordination between uh, the Israeli military and the United States military uh, where they created a cyber weapon called Suxnet who, that was designed to basically destroy a bunch of targets that they could not physically get to. So their target was located deep inside a secret facility, which was these uh, Iranian enrichment um, centrifuges. And what they did was create malware that spread across the globe and was so sensitive that it only activated when it uh, found the exact computer uh, that it was looking for that controlled these centrifuges, modified the actual hardware uh, firmware controlling them, and accelerated them to a speed that caused them to be destroyed. 
they took out one fifth of the capacity of that country uh, to make weapons grade, uh, I think it was uranium. Um, so because of that, this was the first time a cyber weapon had ever been used to significantly destroy a piece of very expensive military hardware. This is the same thing that a missile does, but with code. So this is significant because it's signaled to every other country in the world that this is now acceptable. So people uh, like China, North Korea, Russia, and the United States, who are very good at develop, and actually Israel too, uh, that are very good at developing these kinds of weapons, now think it's perfectly acceptable to launch attacks against people that actually start damaging physical hardware. So when we look at an advanced persistent uh, threat group, uh, one thing that's important to note is they have a giant toolkit. They can basically choose whatever they want when they are planning an attack. And because they're persistent, they're going to stay with one target, and they're only going to go after that one target with everything they have. Now they'll wait and use something that makes the most sense and is the most efficient, but they don't go away. They almost always get in, and the only thing most organizations can do is plan for and try to detect when it happens, which is kind of an uncomfortable new reality. Uh, maybe five, 10 years ago, it was not the case that somebody could get into your network just given an amount of time. But today, even some of the most well-protected companies like RSA, which deals with uh, like security tokens for the government, has still been breached through just clever attacks. So the anatomy of attack of an advanced persistent threat is generally pretty similar. And I'll go through this quickly because we're going, we're a little bit running into time and I don't want to overwhelm you guys too much. But the way that advanced persistent threat looks at a target and looks at the attack process is through first conducting reconnaissance to build a picture of the target surface, know the technical and personal details of the target so that you can assess what the best tool is to use. The next is enumeration. That's when you actually locate specific vulnerabilities and start to see what your options are for staging an attack. The next step is exploitation. That's where you execute your plan and actually go through and use the vulnerabilities you've discovered to elevate your privileges until you can get into a, a network that you're not supposed to be a part of. Uh, the next is ex uh, maintaining access. So as soon as you're in, you have to stay in, otherwise you have to go through all the work you just did. So creating a method of persistence or a way to check in and uh, relay commands back to the malware that you've implanted is the way that you are able to build up to the next step. Next, you can seal the fact that you've entered and clean up any sort of evidence that might give away your presence so that you can lurk in the system for an extended period of time and wait for an opportunity to move on to the next stage, which is progression. That's where any high priority data or any uh, payloads that you want to execute that would maybe destroy something or actually be noticed are actually done. Uh, so if you're in the business of stealing a bunch of data, this would be the phase where you actually gather up all of the information you want to steal. The last phase is exfiltration. That's where you cut your connection and relay any important thing that you've stolen or at least the results of whatever you're trying to do back to the command center. This uh, is the final stage because it usually also wipes out whatever program was on the system and eliminates any evidence that you've done this at all. So if you go through this framework correctly, your target will have something terrible happen to them and they will, they will have no idea what happened. So it's important to understand how the code that you guys write turns into these weapons that are actually capable of destroying, uh, as I said, weapons uh, grade uh, uranium enrichment centrifuges. Um, when you find an error in code, if it's used in enough systems, it basically provides a backdoor or can provide the ability to add extra modules. Now, Eternal Blue was a cyber weapon developed by the NSA that was used to break into computers around the world until it was stolen. And once it was stolen, it was dumped on the internet. And because so many computers were still vulnerable to this method of entry, this vulnerability, anybody could take that method of entry and pair a payload and end up with a tool that would automate whatever that thing was for millions of computers around the world. And that happened when supposedly North Korea took ransomware and added it to this NSA entry weapon and set it loose across the internet. And what happened was it took out hospitals, it took out police stations, it took out everything because it encrypted all of the data on any system that it touched that was vulnerable, which was incredible because it actually shut down hospitals and killed people because people needed to be diverted to other hospitals and the amount of time it took actually cost lives. So it was one of the first instances where a cyber attack actually killed people uh, because it was designed to disrupt critical systems that control infrastructure and actually are you know, life-saving or uh, enable our way of life. So this is kind of a harbinger of uh, the way that these weapons will evolve in the future. They will affect more systems, they will affect more people, and they will actually begin to claim casualties because they will be better designed to disrupt the, the systems that they target. So when a vulnerability is first discovered, uh, as soon as it's found by hacker, well, first it's introduced by the software coders, then it's discovered by hackers, and they usually write a piece of malware that automates the vulnerability so that they can scale it. 
This is important because it gives them the ability to attack a whole bunch of systems rather than just one at a time. And modern methods allow you to automate these attacks so that they work using tools like Shodan to automatically detect any device connected to the internet that's vulnerable to the attack. That means the searching process is literally a module you can import to your malware that allows you to spread to any connected device that's vulnerable, whether the operator knows or not. So at the point that somebody notices this problem uh, and the malware that's basically exploiting it is detected, there is a period of partial visibility. Now, this period of partial uh, visibility is usually an announcement that's given to uh, the companies involved in an attempt to let them fix whatever's wrong before they tell everyone about it. But after a reasonable period, security researchers who have found this, uh, like Google's Project X, uh, Project Zero, sorry, because they hunt zero day, um, they will uh, release this to the public. And the assumption is if the manufacturers or the software developers are not going to fix it, then they're just going to let it burn because somebody will have to fix it if everybody knows how to break it. And that's kind of the reason behind ethical hacking. If people don't fix these things, they will stay vulnerable. And the, the process of an ethical hacker is to find these sorts of problems and report them so that they can be fixed and our society can be safe. Um, at the point that the vulnerability is fixed, that's when software updates are pushed out and people begin to be safe again. But if they don't update these computers, uh, their computers, these vulnerabilities can linger for a really, really shockingly long time. So at the end of this presentation, um, you know a little bit more about the way that this power can be used. Uh, unfortunately, the ethical, hack, uh, the ethical di dilemma facing hackers and security researchers today is that it's often more profitable to sell one of these weapons to an intelligence agency or a private company than it is to report it to the company that it affects. The reason being, it is more profitable for a spyware developer to sell to a, a country that's looking to, let's say, um, actually has a budget and is looking to spy on activists or violate people's human rights. Uh, it is easier for them to sell those as a weapon than it is to fix it sometimes because it's worth so much more money. So we're in a time when people who have this sort of power need to be aware of how their actions actually affect society. White hat hackers, black hat hackers, like they make their choices based on how their actions affect the rest of the world and how they feel about that. So it's a personal choice when you learn about these sort of tools that we're gonna go into, how you choose to use them because you can use the tools we're going to teach in this class to get in a lot of trouble. Uh, it's important to know that your actions do affect other people. Uh, if I teach you how to build a Wi-Fi jammer and you use it in an area that relies on Wi-Fi to do a critical function, it could do something you don't intend. So when you start messing with other people's systems, uh, there is a lot of trouble you can get into and there's a lot of things that you can learn uh, that you might not anticipate uh, just because you don't know why everything is set up the way it is. And when you start getting into other people's things, uh, let's just say it causes a lot of problems. So. Nowadays, the bug bounty program is a safe and legal way for people who find these sorts of vulnerabilities to make money and get recognition for their skills. But it's up to everybody who learns these skills to stay ethical and understand what that means and the point of why we do this. So again, that is to live in a society that has all this nice technology and all these wonderful things, we need these skills to be common knowledge. Because if they're not, then the only people will know who will know them are either you know, elite, like elitist people that, you know, cost so much money that the average company can't afford to bring them in and make their stuff secure, or criminals. And that's not a good circumstance for anyone because we live in America where almost all of our shit is private. So since small businesses run the majority of our infrastructure and the stuff we rely on for daily life, we need to make sure that this stuff is safe and secure and actually start testing it so that we know that the services we rely on as a society aren't going to be vulnerable to something like a nation state attack or a terrorist attack. So um, again, hackers bear the responsibility for making the decision to, to do the right thing or make a bunch of cash. It's a hard choice sometimes. So it's important to know that this is the future we're living in. Um, we're living in a future where cyber weapons can kill people and destroy stuff. And that's a pretty serious responsibility for anyone who's learning these sorts of skills. So that's all I got for today. Um, thank you for showing up. Uh, next class, we'll get into a little bit more about this zero day vulnerabilities. And then the class after that, we're actually going to start getting into Wi-Fi hacking. We're going to go, go over a couple different ways you can hack into Wi-Fi. And actually, you will hack Wi-Fi while you're in this class. So in the future, you will be able to analyze different types of networks, know what type of attacks work against the security that they're using, and reasonably employ those uh, techniques to break into just about any sort of wireless network you encounter. So I'll see you guys next time.